see the the what is this? So what we? Oh, we are still waiting. Where did you go? No way. He's a, yeah, he's great. What's this? Uh, How do you do that thing like right here? Yeah, like that. That's so selfie. Good. Are you making this? All right, one, two, three. There we go. <laughs> Did it work? So send me Astro's article. I will. He, he just sent it to you? Where, where was it? I just saw it. What, I came here? I got here in 93. I left in 99. Okay, I think that the movie is filled up enough that we can start on time. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Stone. So Peter uh, was a PhD student here at CMU. He came in August 1993, right? And uh, he was one of my PhD students. There's a debate where he was a third or the fourth. Oh, there is? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because in the same year I had two students, Astro and Peter. And so Peter has had a brilliant career. And he was just telling me, don't tell all the awards. And I'm not going to tell all the awards, but he does have a, a brilliant academic career. He finished his PhD in 1999, well, 98. Mm -hmm. PhD and in 98. He left in 99. And then he was working for some time at AT&T Bell Labs. And then he became a faculty at uh, UT Austin, where he's now a full professor. And uh, what's the name of the chair. <laughs> oh, the David Bruton. The David Bruton, Bruton chair, chair <laughs> professor. And he has an NSF career award, uh, all sorts of like uh, Guggenheim fellowship, Sloan fellow, uh, Fulbright fellow, AAA fellow. <laughs> and then also uh, he has, uh, for all of us to know, and been very proud of him, he's also a Computers and Thoughts Award winner in uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's now with his own startup, this Kojitai. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And uh, so uh, he, we have been working together, uh, well, as advisor and advisee for a long time, but then also within this RoboCup. So Peter and I see each other every year at least once mm -hmm. at RoboCup. And uh, we have been like uh, working on many things together. And it's really a pleasure to have him back. And for my students, Look at what you can do. <laughs> well, thanks, Manuela, for that very, very generous um, introduction. And to all of you for cramming into this room. It's uh, great to see so many people. It's great to be back here. It's always wonderful to be back at, at CMU. Um, for all that Manuela said, said about me, I'm still trying to live up to my, my advisor, and you know, someday maybe I'll be in the place Manuela is. And uh, you, know, I, you can talk about being a student, but you can also talk about being an advisor. And I, I always strive to be as, half as good an advisor as Manuela was to me. Well, you, you talked about me. I can talk about you. <laughs> you. You turned it over to me, right? <laughs> so. Uh, I've, um, I do many, many different things in, in my lab, and it's actually been wonderful talking with many people here, all of, you know, many of whom are, who are um, interested in, in different aspects of, uh, of my research and my students. Um, and so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with just a, a one-slide overview of sort of my unifying research question and some of the example applications I've worked on. Um, and then I'm going to go into uh, the, the main topic and then maybe at the end pop up to sort of a survey of some of the other things that we do. But I can't, I can't tell you about all the different things we do. Instead, I'm going to sort of focus in on uh, one topic. So if it's not the thing you're most interested in in my work, I apologize. Um, but hopefully you'll... you'll um, You'll enjoy and learn nonetheless. So, um, so the unifying research question, and really this question 
was, was this you know, um, research question appeared in my PhD thesis defense and really in all of my talks since then. It's the sort of um, unifying theme for everything we do in my lab. It's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real time dynamic domains? And been, been attacking this question from various directions for you know, 20, 25 years and, and aim to continue for, for the rest of my career. I don't think we're ever gonna fully solve this. And so, of course, you know, this touches on many different research areas, autonomous agents, multi-agent systems, machine learning, reinforcement learning. These are the communities I, I sort of walk in, and especially, you know, this being the robotics seminar, um, robotics. And um, in my lab, we do research both from the, the bottom up, trying to build you know, fundamental new uh, algorithms and, uh, and sort of theoretical analyses, but also, very importantly, from the top down, being motivated by concrete problems, concrete challenge problems. And, um, and so I think you know, in, in one slide, I can't tell you all of the, the, the algorithmic stuff, but I can tell you in one slide the motivating challenge problems that have been driving me over the years. Um, of course, started with Manuela here, um, the robot soccer project. So this is you know, back when we had IBOs, um, the robots sensing, deciding, and acting in a in a closed loop. We then moved to the um, to the humanoid robots, the Nows. This is the finals of the 2012 RoboCup competition. Ours are the robots with the, the hands behind their back. Um, we ended up winning that competition. At, uh, at University of Texas, we have this tower in the middle of campus that they usually light up orange when the football team wins, but they lit it up orange when we came back from RoboCup, and, which was very a, a big uh, excitement for, for us it's to, to have the, it not just be a sporting event that causes that. Um, but so here's what you know the, the um, RoboCup looks like. If, for those of you who haven't been, been following, uh, I know many people here are familiar with it, but uh, this is again you know, a robot going in um, and having to do uh, all of its uh, motions. That's the first goal in that competition. The, the rules change every year, and that, that was with an orange ball. This past year, it was a it's a black and white ball. It makes things more difficult all, um, every, all the time. But this has been a big source of research inspiration for me over the years. And really, the main theme of this talk is exactly directly motivated by, by RoboCup, as we'll get to in a minute. Um, you have cobots wandering around the, the building here. We have what we call our BWI bots, the Building Wide Intelligence Project. Um, and this is, you know, so we have robots like this one. This is some joint work with, with Ray Mooney where we were doing grounded language learning. Robots learning about, uh, in a uh, semantic, learning semantic parsing from dialogue with people. We ran a week-long experiment where people got to type to the robot in, in free text and improved their language interaction and understanding in a measurable way um, during the course of the time. This is a four times speed up. Our robot doesn't move this fast through the halls, but, um, and, uh, we also actually in that same project, within that same project, uh, I was going to pull up the video, but uh, I didn't get to it before this. But uh, my most recent PhD graduate, and Manuela was on the committee of the, of of, um, of his. It's, uh, it was Piyush Kandawal, and we worked on this prob problem called the multi-robot human guidance problem, where we take. Um, Four, uh, several of these robots that are wandering through the hall, each working on background tasks. And, um, and a person walks up to one of them and says, please take me to Peter's office. Rather than the robot guiding the person all the way there, they coordinate amongst themselves to have each one point the person in a, in, in a direction, and another robot goes and meets the person at the next intersection, where they've assuming that if, the if there isn't a robot there, the person will make a wrong turn. So there's like a model of what the person would do without guidance, and trying to get robots to, to aid the person to coordinate in a way that gets the person to the goal as quickly as possible, but minimizing the other robot's time away from the background task. We can formulate this as a Markov decision process and made some contributions in uh, where the uncertainty is where the person will move and, um, and made uh, some, some progress there. We also had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge. I've, I'm not going to show that. Um, we've retired that car since then, but I still think a lot about what the, the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. Will we have uh, traffic signals and stop signs, or will we have something that looks more like this? This is something that my student Kurt Dressner and I developed back in 2003. People looked at us like we were crazy when we said, oh, you know, some, one day there's going to be autonomous cars. There'll be many on the road. Um, and here what's going on is, is the cars that are white have called ahead to reserve 
observe a uh, reservation in, uh, in space time. The ones that are yellow don't have a reservation yet, but as soon as they turn white, they have a guaranteed path through the intersection that won't collide with any of the other cars. Um, this was you know, sort of the origin of that work. We're now looking at, well, what happens if this scales up to full cities? Um, we have, there's some very interesting mechanism design questions that come up here. Um, and uh, for how, how can we get, you know, sort of, um, efficient throughput of, of cars when they're, when they're autonomous and able to coordinate at this very fine grain. So that's sort of the one slide introduction to the kinds of, of problems that, that, that motivate our, our research. But in this talk, as advertised by the title, is it's going to be about robot skill learning. And when I gave my last talk here at CMU, it was a part of the machine learning seminar, it was a little over two years ago. Um, I ended with some um, multi-layered, uh, what, what I called overlapping layered learning. I'm going to sort of start this talk from that point. So some of you, if you were in that, that room, this will look familiar, the beginning part. But then I'm going to jump from there to the, to the and back part. So I'm going to talk about real world um, I'm going to talk, talk about how the real world has uh, sort of jump-started our simulation, but then how we get from simulation back to the real world. So I'll talk um, RoboCup soccer is the real world starting point. And I know people are familiar with it, and many people here, but I think you know, for those of you who aren't, I'll just give my take on, on, uh, on sort of why this is such a, a wonderful domain. Then I'll talk about the optimization and simulation, the layered learning, which, uh, like I say, some of you may have seen before. Um, but one of the questions I got last time I was here was, well, does the learning and simulation translate directly to the real robot? And at that point, I had to say no. Um, but now I, can, now I can come and report that, that uh, a couple years later that, yes, we've introduced a method called grounded simulation learning that can take what we learn in simulation and sort of close this reality gap um, in a way that's fairly general purpose and I'd like to describe to you. So first, RoboCup, RoboCup soccer, it's the grand challenge, is to, to beat the World Cup champions on a real soccer field by the year 2050. Um, still relatively early stages. There's other grand, grand challenges that have gone for, for longer. We've been, but we just had the 20th RoboCup, I guess. And uh, um, there's been a lot of, a lot of progress. The, the key f features of this as a challenge problem is that uh, there's, first of all, always a closed loop. So instead of thinking, let's do the vision problem one year and let's do the walking problem or the, or the planning problem another year, there's always been a fully autonomous closed loop at each stage. And what, gets, what changes from year to year is how difficult that the problem is. Um, and there's, so there's always been, it's always been a multi-robot problem. It's always been a robotics problem. It's very inspiring, and it's just always, I love showing people what it looked like in the first years, because, you know, it's sort of embarrassing to watch right now that this is what it looked like in 1997 and 98, but you have to realize at that point, just getting more than one robot running at the same time was a huge, uh, you know, breakthrough. And so, or not breakthrough, but a huge challenge. And so, you know, the robots, you know, they, they scored goals. Here's one, there was no goalie, um, so it didn't really, you know, uh, have much opposition, but it still scored. And I should say, these aren't all videos from my teams. These are from colleagues around the world. Um, these, were, these were from some of our robots uh, were in in, uh, in this league, this was the first year of the IBOs. You know, they'd fall down, they'd get up, but it would, it would just, they would work. And that was a big achievement back then. Then you fast forward 10 years from then, but still 10 years ago, um, many of these same leagues, but now uh, the robot's moving much more quickly. They're passing, they're, there's, there's interaction. There was just visible progress. And we, every year we see things improve. That year was the beginning of the humanoid league, so it was just a penalty shot competition where the robots were just kicking the ball. Um, but you know, they were able to do the penalty shots and sort of dive. And, um, <laughs> now if you look at those, that league, they, they look like real soccer games as well. So, so it's just been you know, really, um, really inspiring, leading to lots of progress with the sort of the mantra that good problems produce good science. And there have been research advances, advances in many different areas, many publications, PhD theses inspired by, um, you know, of course, many from, from CMU, but also around the world, um, inspired by these problems that come up at Robocop. And so one of the... Um, one of the sort of areas where that, it, that inspired was sort of was um, progress in in robot vision. 
there's always been there's there's been great progress over the years in computer vision but when we started in robocup there was there weren't that many people working on the constraints that robots bring to the vision problem so um, and you know one way to, to get a to get a sense of that is this is this is through the robots camera what the what the world looks like as it's trying to figure out where the ball is where the goal is we had to figure we had to to um, in 30 hertz, 30 times a second, where there wasn't even time when we started this on the processors we were using, there wasn't even time to run a Huff transform. Um, and so, you know, we couldn't use cutting edge state of the art computer vision algorithms. We had to figure out what can we, how can we go from these pixels coming in at 30 frames per second to the, just the information we need for decision making. And so this le led to maybe not research that was, was you know, central to, com to computer vision, but really opened up this thinking about robot vision. And so one of the contributions that we had uh, in this space, a former student of mine, Mohan Sridharan, with learning a color map, rather than uh, we allowed the robot to sort of use its knowledge of the structure of the world to walk around, it knew that there would be a yellow goal in front of it, so any uniform set of pixels, it could say, oh, that must be yellow. It knew that there would be pink below yellow, so that had to be pink. It could turn around and say, oh, the, I know there's a blue goal, so those pixels must be blue. And by walking around, it could like, sort of learn in the current lighting conditions what the color map was and then use that to um, to feed into to the uh, to the decision making um, of the robot and just to show some of my favorite uh, last couple favorite RoboCup videos from a, a competition in uh, 2000 it's, it'll start in a second um, Fox Soccer Channel took and they took some artistic liberty we don't have this kind of fan support at RoboCup um, but uh, and we don't have referees like this but this is what the games looked like <laughs> back then and, um, and you know again this was closed loop they have to see they have to decide they have to act and these were uh, <laughs> sped up a little bit and um, <laughs> And there's a really nice soundtrack here where they're talking about Spot and Lassie and all the, I don't know, there's <laughs> sort of jokes, but, um, but you know, one, one really, I think, important thing to see here is this, the, 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 the robot walking up to the goalie, getting sort of pushed to the side, but still knows that it's, which way it's facing, to, to know to kick sideways rather than forwards. And this, always integrating the, uh, and I won't, I won't show more of this, the, uh, always integrating the sort of um, vision, localization, sensing, deciding, all within a computational budget has always been you know, sort of um, an ongoing challenge for us. I already showed, that's the tower they lit orange after we won, but then we said that the grand challenge is, is by the year 2050 to create uh, humanoid, humans, humanoid robots that could beat the best World Cup champion. We don't have humanoid robots that can get on the same field that, and play with people yet, but we do have wheeled robots that can, and since 2007 we've had um, W the winners of the uh, the middle sized league it's called so these are sort of you know robots about this big moving very quickly on wheels um, they uh, we have the people from the board of trustees of RoboCup playing against the robots. The people who build the robots always say, oh, no, 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 we can't let you on the same field. They're way too fast for you. They're going to run you over. They're going to beat you easily, and they're going to hurt you. And, uh, and we say, no, well, let's give it a try anyway. And, um, and so this is what that sort of looks like. It does look scary when we're on the outside, but then when we put people on the field with the robots, you can see these sort of um, aging amateur soccer players who are still able to pass the ball around the robots. And, um, you know, every year it does get a little bit harder. Um, here's a, a goal we scored, but <laughs> but uh, they called me for offsides, so they didn't count that. But you know, in any case, um, the. Oh, the, re the no, no, that wasn't you that time. It, 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 was, the, it was a different referee. M Manuel is always saying, "Oh, let the robots score. We can't. They, the people can't win. Let the robots score." <laughs> but um. It, it gets it gets harder every year, but you know, we're not sure if that's because the robots are getting better or we're getting older. But one way or another, there's there's progress being made. So you know, good. So that's that's the that's RoboCup. And, and like I say, I know you all are. I could talk all the, the whole time about RoboCup, but I'm gonna I'm gonna instead um, now talk go a little deeper into uh, one particular problem that was motivated by one particular league in RoboCup um, and talk about the optimization in simulation using a methodology that, uh, that we call layered learning um, that was originated as a part of my PhD thesis but that we've really expanded on greatly in recent years. And um, 
The idea of layered learning is that it's f designed for domains that are too complex to tractably map state features directly to the outputs. Now, nowadays, I think, you know, some people are saying there are no such domains. You can do end-to-end -end learning on everything, and I don't agree with that. I think there is, you know, it's really impressive the kinds of things we can do with end-to-end -end learning, but I think there's also still, at least now and for the, for the foreseeable future, going to be a lot of value still to hierarchical decomposition of, into subtasks and learning and how to figure and, and putting those thing, putting, piecing those, um, those different subtasks together. So within layered learning, the assumption is that there's already a hierarchical subtask decomposition given. In other research, we are trying to learn this, this decomposition, but let's assume for this purpose that that comes manually. And then machine learning is used to exploit data to train or adapt um, the different layers or behaviors with the idea that learning in one layer feeds directly into the next layer. That's the, that's the constraint. So you can imagine um, the agent learning a world state, learning individual behaviors all the way up to, to high level goals in these different layers. Back in 97, we did this within the context of the 2D Simulation League. And um, this was a team for, from myself and, and Manuela. And um, we had three different layers using a neural network for ball interception, a decision tree for pass evaluation, and we, used a, we invented a new uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithm for the pass selection problem. Um, I, I won't show that, uh, the, the competition from that. Um, we ended up winning the 2D Simulation League that year, but then we also applied it on real robots. So we said, um, this was in 2006, we took these IBOs and we had them learning to walk back and forth across the field using a policy gradient reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and they, uh, by doing this, they were timing themselves, so it was all fully autonomous. They were just noticing how big these beacons were in their image to, to know how far they had traveled. Could time themselves, they were experimenting with different gates, and we ended up with the fastest walk on these, these robots at the time. Then using that walk, which could be relearned on a different robot, it was used as the, the um, the layer that input to this ball control layer. The, the, how does the robot um, uh, pinch the ball under its chin so that it can pass it or, or shoot it or something. And so this was a two layer system on real robots. And we looked this sort of paradigm for layered learning, uh, we had, there were sort of two different variants. There's what we called sequential layered learning, and I'll introduce these sort of schematics, where, where you would learn one behavior, and then freeze the parameters of that behavior, and then use that as the basis for the next learned behavior. That was the original version. We then found that there were um, situations where there's, it would be advantageous to keep learning the first behavior while learning the second behavior at the same time, and we called that concurrent layered learning. Um, but both of these have problems, or both of these uh, have challenges. With sequential layered learning, it can be too limiting to the, to the joint layer policy space. Concurrent layered learning, there's more, it's increased dimensionality during this concurrent learning phase, and it can make learning slower. And so, um, so my student Patrick McAlpine and I have now sort of it, augmented this methodology to what we call overlapping layered learning. And this is sort of, you can see schematically what we mean by here, we have sort of three different variants of um, overlapping layered learning. One is for combining independently learned behaviors, um, which is illustrated here, where you can you learn the behaviors separately and then relearn some subset of them. I'll illustrate that in a second. Or partial concurrent layered learning, as you can sort of, it, it, as the um, is sort of obvious from what this is, how this is shown. Or previously learned layer refinement, where you can, after you've learned the second behavior, then go back, freeze its parameters, and relearn the the first parameters. And so these are sort of the high high level methodologies, and we've applied this in the context. Um, I'll show you what the base learning algorithm we use is in a second. But we've applied this in the context of the 3D simulation league of Robocup, which looks a little bit um, like this. Well, first I'll tell you, it's got 11 on 11. A Autonomous robots playing in an ODE, realistic sort of a physics physics engine, simulates the the now robot not perfectly at all, and that's what mo will motivate the later part of my talk. Um, the robot has noisy visual uh, information; they can communicate over limited bandwidth. So this is just sort of what it what it looks like. Um, th you can see that just you know getting the robots to stand up in this environment is a challenge by itself. Um, and uh, we ended up. This is actually a, a video from the 2011 competition. Our robots ended up winning that that competition without ever passing the ball, because they had they had learned to walk 
uh, walk the, and, and dribble the ball more robustly than any of the other teams. So most of the goals looked sort of like this one. Um, there are some robots being sort of removed. There's rules here. You can't crowd all the robots in front of the goal, and you can't uh, knock over the other robots. So there's sort of penalties. They get beamed back to midfield when they, when they do something illegal. But our robots were the, were the best at, um, at, in this context, of just being able to walk robustly. And um, so that's sort of what the league looked like. And that was enough in 2002. 11 and 2012, and then let me just tell you what the, the base learning algorithm we used here was a, was, um, a policy gradient reinforcement learning algorithm, but based on a, an evolutionary strategy. It's called uh, CMAES. The walk itself, we, um, we used a, a double, inverted, double linear inverted pendulum model, which basically means the, um, we modeled it as uh, the robot's, uh, the foot acting as a fulcrum and then swinging the center of mass over that fulcrum using the sort of equations of motion of a pendulum, then having a double support phase and then using the other foot as a, as a fulcrum. And so um, once you, you can model it that way, but it leaves open a whole bunch of parameters, like how, how big should the step size be and how much should the center of mass move side to side while you're taking these steps and how fast should you move the steps so you can you can imagine you know tens of parameters that you could just go and, and hand code and that's what people did before we you know went in this league beforehand but we instead uh, brought this um, this CMAES algorithm of Hansen to, to bear in this task, which is basically a, a stochastic derivative free numerical optimization method. It's basically the candidates are sampled from this um, multidimensional Gaussian where the mean keeps shifting over, over time to explain the best performing in the, uh, sort of points in the space um, from the previous generation and the, the covariance updates to control the search size. So you, you know, over time it's, it's doing a broader search and then focuses in this case towards a local optimum. There's no guarantee of global uh, optimality in this case. And so using this, we took a walk that we had developed on, the, um, on our real robot, on the now, and ported it directly into the simulator and it worked without any you know, sort of uh, tuning. It worked, but it was slow. It was stable, um, but it was slow. And so this was taking the real world and using it to help our simulated team. So, um, and then we used this as a starting point to, to use... Um, to, to try to learn from. Now, back in 2010, before this year when we, when we ended up winning, um, we had optimized using CMAS from this walk and, and Patrick ran into my office one day and said, oh, we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do great this year. The robot's running twice as fast as any other robot. Um, you know, I think we've, I've got this working you know, better than I imagined. And, um, and so, but then I said, okay, great. Well, then now let's put it into a behavior. And he said, okay, well, you know, here's the robot starting and now here's the fast walk, the F over it. And now I said, okay, now we have to make it slow down to kick the ball or do something else. And this is what happened. <laughs> and so we kept having to hand tune and slow it down until in the end it wasn't doing well at all. And we ended up finishing sort of middle of the pack in the competition. We went back to the drawing board and that's where layered learning came in. So then we started doing things like this. We said, well, okay, let's in the context of, so when there's a different letter over the a different set of learned parameters. So we said, let's learn one another. So this is where the robot had to uh, do what we call an obstacle course, where it's switching between a go-to-target behavior and a sprint behavior without falling over. Um, and then we added in a, um, a uh, behavior for positioning, positioning near the ball, which would allow it to dribble. And so these were what the, op this is sort of the training setup, and it was, optimizing parameters for each of these behaviors in conjunction with one another until it ended up with this walk that was one, the one that I could put into the competition I showed you before where it could win the whole thing without ever passing because it was just had this ability to, um, to walk more, um, more robustly and uh, more stably than the other teams. Um, so that was, that was fine for a couple of years, but of course in RoboCup, one of the whole ideas is that people learn from each other and people are motivated from each other. So people, other teams started doing this. And uh, so this wasn't enough in 2013. So we had to say, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Three skills are not enough. Let's now start kicking and passing and doing what you really expect to have happen in, in, um, in RoboCup. And so we ended up learning, using overlapping layered learning, 19 different behaviors for things like uh, kicking different distances and kicking different heights and getting up from a, fall down, from a falling down position, um, getting up from your back, walking, sprinting, using all of these different, using overall 500 parameters that had to be optimized during the course of, of learning.
And I'm not going to tell you about all of them, um, but there's you know, things like um, approaching the ball. So here's a behavior just to get into a position where you could kick the ball. And then separately, we could learn an independent behavior of just kicking the ball as long as possible. So these are, this will be an example of combining <laughs> independent learned behaviors. Yeah, we didn't optimize it to stand up just to kick the ball far, so it had to get up afterwards. Um, that's, you know, if we wanted it to stand up, then we'd have to change the evaluation function. That's fine. But here, this is kicking from a fixed position. And the other one was walking to get into a position. To actually use this in a game, you have to do both together. So it learned these independently, and then we would put them together just relearning some of of the parameters, keeping some of the approach parameters fixed, keeping some of the kicked parameters fixed, but then re-optimizing um, in, uh, in this way to, to, to learn at the seams so that they would work well together. Um, and so that led to this sort of final, uh, or, or um, this ability now to both walk up to the ball, position behind it, dribble it for some time, um, but then also approach the ball to kick it. So now it's in the approach mode because it knows it's lining up for a kick, and then execute the kick um, instead of dribbling it the whole way through. Um, so, and then the other one, I think some people said they saw this talk last time and remembered, um, or saw this in the talk last time and remembered this part. We also, one of the, there was an undergrad in my lab, Mike Depanet, who said, well, with this kick, we could actually score on the kickoff uh, if we optimize for exactly how high the ball goes so it can bounce over the goalie when, it's, uh, when it gets there. <laughs> and so he learned this, but this was against the rules, and you know, because you can't score on the kickoff. So he said, no problem. We'll also learn a separate behavior of the robot touching the ball first before the, before the kick. Um, and and uh, <laughs> the problem is, when we put these together, they, uh, they didn't work well, right? Because they hadn't been learned in con conjunction. And this, we did not script this. This, was, uh, this just emerged when we tried to put the two behaviors together. <laughs> And the first robot, we didn't kill it in time, and the first robot got very, very frustrated. Um, and, uh, but then if we learn them together using layered learning, you can see the inset here of, of them actually working together. And we um, now it's able to touch the ball, get out of the way, and then the robot was able to kick and score. And we didn't show this until the finals of the competition. Um, so that uh, you know, then we were, we were winning 1-0 right, right at the beginning of the game. And so I'll, show, I'll actually show you that in a second. But the nice thing about the simulation League of RoboCup is that, first of all, it allows us a lot of data to, to be able to, to learn in, in a methodology we couldn't have done on the real robot because it takes lots of um, simulations to be able to search this parameter space. And then we can also do controlled experiments. The competitions are always, well, it's nice if you win or it does, you know, sometimes you lose and that's fine, um, but they're not controlled experiments. Right? But then we can go and we can play thousands of games against the other teams because people have to release their binaries to participate in the following year. And so we can say, well, you know, how well did we do if we only used the dribbling behavior against the other, you know, our last year's team or some of the other teams that did well in the competition? This is the number of goals we scored in a 10-minute game over those 1,000 games with the standard deviation. And then we could say, well, what if we used layered learning but didn't use that kickoff trick? Or what if we did use it? What's the difference um, in performance? And one of the really nice things here is that we could also change the robot body. Right? So we can say, what if the robot has longer legs, or it has quicker moving legs, or wider hips, or we add toes to the, to, to the foot? We can go through exactly the same layered learning procedure and, and then say, well, how well does each of those types of robots do? Um, and how do they, how do they play? With, and, uh, it takes now, it would have taken a, a year and a half of compute time using this methodology on a single computer to learn for each of these types. Um, so, you know, we're, I'm not going to claim that this is data efficient learning, and we clearly could not have done this on a real robot. But in this case, the target application was the simulation league and um, and so we could then go and you know play against all of the teams from the from the competition um, multiple times and and find that we really did have a, a, a better team than they did um, uh, I think we, yeah, so we played over 11,000 games and we had uh, 67 ties, otherwise won them. And so here's the highlights from that 2014 uh, finals. Here's the kickoff um, that, we, that we didn't show until, that, uh, until the beginning of, of, the, of the final game. And so you know, the goalie was not even, didn't even react because he didn't, didn't see it coming. But here's what some of the other goals look like. So here's one, um, you know, the robot being able to walk 
over to the to the and and there's some a whole bunch of multi-robot coordination that I'm not talking about here. Where should they go? How should they coordinate with one another? Where should they pass? But here now they're moving. You know, the, one robot kicked it out to the side where another one could position and execute this pass um, and then kick towards the the goal. Um, that we ended up winning that. Uh, that competition we defended again in 2015 and again in 2016. Patrick reason, recently told me the, the statistic, which I hadn't realized. Over the last six years, um, our team has given up seven goals and scored 467 goals in this competition. Um, which and. Uh, Patrick's going to graduate soon, and then you know we're going to be done, and other teams will, I'm sure, pick up because um, this is really his his brilliance. Patrick McAlpine has done a wonderful job here. But this is what it looks like in the finals of the 2016 competition. Um, some of the goals there's now much more uh, much more passing. That was a nice save by the other team, but we had a robot ready to to come up and uh, and and score afterwards. Um, so this is what you know really layered learning allowed us to do is put together all of these various um, skills. Um, and you can find lots more information here at our at our website. Okay, so yes, question. Uh, so you're talking about if you have two behaviors and you want to transition, so you keep some of the parameters fixed and you relearn some. So uh, how do you decide what parameters? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in this work, the the curricular, the layer, you know, the the decomposition of the task and which parameters were opened and, and not was done manually. In other research that we're doing now, we're we're looking at exactly this problem of, of you know what's um, what is the right way to break down the problem in a, you know in a more automated and pro, uh, programmatic way. I have a student, Sanmit Narvikar, who has uh, um, a paper he's about to pre present at Amos and. Um, that in the what we're calling curriculum learning, where it's learning these kinds of things, not exactly on this task, but learning exactly what are the ways to combine these tasks. So, so in this case, it was uh, that you'd have to ask Patrick for the details because he's the one he's the one who did it. But I mean, it was intuitively it was you know the. the um, so for, for using the example of the robot approaching the ball and then having to uh, having to kick the ball, there were um, there was the, the problem if we just use the the approach by by itself is that it would um, that it would get to uh, it would get just a little bit offset from the ball and then this exact same kicking motion would would sort of just whiff on the ball a little bit. So we would take the kick and still use the keep fix the parameters for moving back the leg, but open up the sort of the target position again. Right? You know, so there was there were certain pr parameters that had some semantics for us as to that we, that we could tell were the ones that were getting that were not connecting well. Um, so again, this, is, this was in this case was was uh, manually decided, but it's with with sort of intuition from watching in these cases. But um, but yeah, that's not the long-term solution, and it can't be. It needs to these, this needs to be automated as well. This was more to see it as an existence proof. Okay, but now something I think you know that, that is is very important here is that that was learning in simulation where we didn't care if it would transfer back to the real robot because simulation was the league we were participating in, um, and we didn't care how long it took because you know this was simulation we could just run on a on a big cluster, um, but we also have this the the um, the humanoid robot the, in the in the standard platform league, and. As you could probably tell, what was learned in simulation, the legs would just move very quickly in ways that, that couldn't possibly be done in the real robot. And that's partly the fault of the simulation. It's not perfect. We could have said, well, let's make the simulator you know, just like the real world. And anybody who's tried that, that's just, you know, that's a losing proposition, right? It's, it's, there's inevitably going to be a reality gap between the simulator and the, and the real world. So, um, and so, you know, on, on the surface, it seems the two solutions are the two options are just learn only in the real world, um, and uh, but there's problems there. You, can, you know, it's not going to be data. Uh, you need a very data efficient method to do that, which limits the scopes of, of or limit the scope of the types of algorithms you can use. It requires a lot more supervision. The robots can break. There's wear and tear over time, um, or you could do as I've been suggesting, just learn in simulation and transfer it directly to the real robot. But um, there's you know, some advantages there. Uh, as shown here, there's thousands of trials in parallel, no supervision needed, robots don't break. But if you just move it to the real world, this is what happens. So this is what we did when we just learned, took the walk that was learned in simulation and put it on the, on the real robot. It fell over after just two or three steps. And you can sort of see um, 
you know, it's first of all, it's, this is in slow motion, the same walk. It's not even able to execute what it looked like in the real ro world. This is it's trying to, and it just sort of, you know, it, it doesn't apply, right? The simulator is not perfect. And so, um, so this is, this is what motivates grounded simulation learning, which just from the high level I'll motivate is a way of us taking data from the real world, analyzing how, it's, how the simulator is different from the real world in the local space of the policy that we're currently executing. So we're not going to claim to make the simulator the same as the real world everywhere, but we're going to try to change the simulator so that trajectories in the simulator match more closely to the trajectories that we see in the real world from the same policy. Right, so it'll mean changing the simulator, but in a way that's only locally effective. Um, so just to introduce a little bit of notation to do this, we, there's an environment, the robot's in some state, it chooses an action according to the policy pi. This is sort of the standard reinforcement learning um, paradigm. The, the policy is parameterized um, according to some set of parameters theta. So, that, you know, for instance, how much the center of mass moves back and forth or how long the legs, the, the step sizes are, those are the parameters um, of the policy. Then the environment responds with some new state after the action is taken according to a distribution that's modeled by the simulator, the transition probabilities. And then there's co uh, some cost function. It's a scalar, scalar cost for every state action pair. And the goal is to find your set of parameters, theta, that minimizes the cost. That's the J, which is the cost, which is defined as the, uh, the expectation over the sum of the costs of your state action pairs over time, over the length of a trajectory. Right, so this is just standard um, sort of reinforcement learning uh, policy optimization framework. Learning and simulation, the idea is it's very much the same. You have all the same components as the real world, the state, the action space, the cost function, but now the simulation dynamics are different. So, um, which just means that you have a different transition function, when you, which means that basically if you execute an action in the real world, it might take you here, action in the simulation simulation that also works on the, on the physical robot. So this is what motivates grounded simulation learning. It's a framework for robot learning in simulation based on modifying the simulator with real world data so that the policies learned in simulation work in the real world. From the high level, it's you execute the, your policy on the physical robot. You ground the uh, it, it optimizes the policy in the simulator to find your better, your better policy, and then you test it on the physical robot and repeat. Right? It's an iterative process, so you keep improving the simulator so it's closer to the real world, optimizing in the simulator, testing it in the real world, and, and sort of repeating in this way. And uh, as I just, uh, yeah, I should have shown this slide instead of doing it with my hands. So uh, exactly as shown here. So. The, uh, now, the question is, how do we ground the simulator? That's, uh, so we assume that the simulator is parameterized in some way. Um, it, or, so ideally, if the simulator is parameterized, by, parameterized in some way by, by phi, then and if we had a measure of similarity between the state transition distributions, where this is the, the, um, the you, you, get a, you can get, record a data set um, from executing the policy in the real world, and then you can say we want to find the parameters of the simulator such that the, the next state in the simulator is as close as possible to the next state in the real world for this data set. Now that would be ideal if we could search through parameter space in the simulation. That's not always possible. Um, and so because it's, it's not always clear how can you define the parameters of the simulator. So we take a slightly different approach. Instead what we do is we, we replace the robot's action with an action that, pro um, that produces a more realistic transition. So you have a, so you have a policy that you're going to run on the real robot. You then um, inst you take that action and say, what would that action accomplish if we ran it on, on the real robot? So, or sorry, okay, let me, let me start that over. You take an action that you're going to apply in the simulator. We ask, what transition would that, um, that same action yield in the real world? And then we ask, what, how do I replace the action in the simulator such that when I execute that action, I get the same transition I would have gotten? 
right? So in other words, we're going to learn a, a, a mapping from actions from the simulator to modified actions that give us the, um, the desired effects in the real world. And so that's going to be a grounding function g, which I'm now going to expand another level. We're basically going to, um, we can talk about the robot's dynamics, which is a mapping, if we call x the set of joint configurations, then um, the robot's forward dynamics is the, the state you're in, the action you, you take, what joint configurations does that lead to? And the simulator's inverse dynamics is if you're in a state and you want to get to a particular joint configuration, what action should you take? And so if you had these two functions, which we're, I'll, again, I'll tell you how we get those two functions on the next slide, but if you had those two functions, then you can replace every action in the simulator with an action that would give you the transition that you would have gotten in the real world by applying first the forward transition from the real world and then the inverse, trans, uh, the inverse simulation in the, in, the, uh, in the simulator. And so how do we get this F and the forward and back and inverse models? Um, we're going to do that using supervised learning by recording a bunch of sequences on the, um, on the real world and in simulation. We use a neural network. So the forward model is, uh, is trained from the state in action um, to a predicted next state. We grab a bunch of uh, real world trajectories over 2,000 time steps. The inverse model, we take a bunch of simulated trajectories and, and learn the transformed action. And so now we have this. Um, just using standard uh, supervised learning methods, we have this forwards and inverse models. And um, it's act we thought that, OK, now after we do this, the robot's going to look much more like it does in the real world when we run it in the simulator. So here's what it looks like it, the simulator when, it's the ro when the simulator is not grounded. It, it's a, a policy that we, were, that, that we were trying to run from the real, um, real robot. It looks sort of like it's sliding. We thought, OK, now after we do this grounding, it's going to look much better. And actually, it doesn't look much different. So it's sort of subtle here what's, what's being changed. You can't visibly see it. But when we, um, but when we take, when we take the, uh, the result of this grounding and, and put it through grounded simulation learning um, using a starting point of the, uh, a walk engine that was developed by one of the RoboCup teams, UNSW, um, we could then test a bunch of different, uh, I guess, three different types of transitions. We could go from the um, 3D simulation league to the, the robot directly. We could also use another simulator, a more de detailed simulator, Gazebo, to, to do a bunch of these uh, simulations you know, from one simulation to another simulation to test this methodology um, as well. And, uh, and again, the policy optimization is happening within the simulator uh, using CMAES as before. So here's the initial policy. This is the, the, a robot walking before we do any learning from the real world. Um, so it's run, walking at about uh, 19 and a half um, centimeters per second. This is one of the fastest uh, walks, I guess 19.3, one of the fastest walks that was uh, achieved on the nows at the time. We then did grounded uh, simulation learning using SimSpark, that's the 3D Simulation League, as the simulator. We learned a, a new policy we, after grounding um, and uh, went for 10 different generations of CMAES, tested at the end of each one um, which one does best on the real robot. We found the, the best of those ones that usually happened after three or four uh, generations of, of CMAES. And so we call that one iteration of grounded simulation learning. And so we got to 26.3 centimeters per second. So this is what the robot walk looked like at that point. This was at this point, as far as we know, this is the fastest anybody's been able to make these uh, robots walk in a stable way. Some people have had it walk faster than that for a few steps and fast, fall over, but these, were, these are stable walks. And then we repeated another regrounding of the simulator using that policy, um, another iteration through grounded simulation learning and got up to 28 centimeters per second. And so here's the final walk um, that we were able to achieve using this methodology. And um, it sort of learned to squat a little bit lower to the ground. It's moving its legs faster. Um, and, uh, and then we could also repeat this methodology where we start, we learn instead of SimSpark and Gazebo, um, and we were also to get, able to get a comparably uh, fast walk. Then we could do many more. You can't do tons of experiments here because it's still a, um, you know, there is a component of trying to run it on a real robot, which takes time. But we could do many more experiments when we try to transfer from one simulator to another using this method. Um, if we directly transferred from SimSpark to Gazebo, seven out of 10 trials would just fall over. Um, 
there would be some improvement, but not a lot of improvement over the over the initial um, over the initial walk in uh, in gazebo. If we just did learning but added a little bit of noise, um, then that would correct a little bit. The robot would now only fall over out of five out of the ten policies. There is a little more improvement. But if we use grounded simulation learning, we got a much more stable walk. Nine out of the ten, it was able to stay uh, stable and improve uh, and improve much more. And so, in the, in the paper, we go into a lot more details of the conclusions we can make in this sort of simulation to simulation um, aspect. So this grounded simulation learning, what I think is, is very nice about it, is that it allows us to test on the real world, but still take advantage of all of the simulation learning and all of the sort of computational power there, um, and, but still keep checking in to see how is, is, that sim is the learning that's happening in, in simulation um, effective or relevant on the robot, and, and keep retuning the, the simulator to make it more so. Using this method, we did get the fastest known walk, and now we're still working on in this uh, on extending to other robots, uh, robotic tasks and platforms, um, understanding when it works and doesn't, and also reformulating um, the uh, the learning of, of this this G function. There's many other options. We did this sort of forwards and inverse um, functions to minimize one step transition errors, but really what we care about is the error over the sequences or whole trajectories. And so reformulating the problem from that perspective may lead to, to further improvements. That's ongoing. And there's also a connection here to much more theoretical work on safe learning. So we have a paper about to be presented at Amos. Josiah Hanna is the uh, PhD student who's working on this. He's also the one who worked on, uh, who introduced grounded simulation learning. And the idea in, in I'm you know, we want to have a right, so we can have some safety bounds on uh, you know in, in robot soccer as well. So what you know, the robot will fall over, but there are many other more safety uh, critical applications, and you may want to have a lower bound. Um, and so that connects to the general problem in reinforcement learning of off problem of off policy evaluation. Um, the problem statement is that you given some evaluation policy, so the one you want to try on the new robot. Um, but you only have a data set of trajectories generated by some known behavior, your behavior policy, um, and there's some confidence level you want to, uh, to achieve. You want to determine, we want to try to determine a lower bound such that the value of the evaluation to all the details of uh, bootstrap data sets. Um, you can then estimate the value of your evaluation policy um, using those, those different data sets. Um, you have to have a way of saying, well, how well would the, the policy do um, on, based on uh, how, how well would the evaluation policy do given the behavior policy trajectories? The standard way of doing that is important sampling. Some, again, if you're not familiar with these uh, important sampling, you're not going to learn about it in this one slide. But for those of you who are, um, it's basically a way of um, estimating the value of, of the, the evaluation policy by reweighting based on the probability that you would execute an action in the evaluation policy compared to the probability in the behavior policy. And, um, and there was, there's a way of, of getting a, a confidence interval based on this bootstrapping with important sampling that was, was, is, was state of the art when we came in here. Um, the problem is that it could have very high variance. And so what we introduced in this work um, that uh, you'd have to, you'll have to read the paper for the details, but the, the main idea was to do model-based off-policy evaluation. So we, the data, we have our data set of trajectories from the behavior policy. We take a subsample of that. that. Those are our bootstrap data sets. From each of those, we create a model of an MDP. And then we do model-based off-policy estimation. So we basically solve that MDP that's based on, that's, that's induced from a subset of our data. We find what the value of our policy would be in that MDP, and then we repeat with a different subset of the data. So we have a bunch of different transition, MDPs with different transition dynamics, each induced from a different subset of the data. Um, you repeat this many times, and you can get an estimator that ends up um, empirically. We're able to um, our two methods for this model-based bootstrapping are the red, the, the red, and the this, this dot do is get as uh, the the without ever able to get there um, much more much more quickly, but still remaining remaining safe. So. I know that was a little bit of a whirlwind, but it's just sort of an, I think a, an example of of how this. Um, the real world, you know, the problem that, that we have of grounded simulation learning then motivates a much more general algorithmic contribution. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, to read this, the AMOS paper about this. 
So I'm almost running out of time. This, the, um, the safe learning with bootstrap models is, uh, you know, um, I, just, I just talked about there's, there's future work is to connect this directly to the grounded simulation learning. It's just motivated by it right now. But so what I've shown you during the course of this talk so far, um, basically this real world starting point from the beginning, I would just give a little bit of overview of some of the other things that are going in in my lab. I'll just do, um, you know, the, the main themes are um, reinforcement learning and multi-agent systems. So I'll also look to, uh, give a sense of both within reinforcement learning. We've looked a lot at, at how we can learn from human interaction. Um, some of you are familiar, I talked to some people today who are familiar with the Tamer system of Brad Knox, um, learning from positive and negative feedback. We've looked at transfer learning. I already mentioned curriculum learning. So this question of how can we come up with this um, you know, sort of uh, curriculum for reinforcement learning automatically. That's the work of Samit Narvikar. Um, my student Elad Liebman is working on music, musical uh, applications of reinforcement learning. Um, Todd Hester worked on uh, reinforcement learning applied to, to uh, real robots. And my, one of my other most recent graduates, Matthew Houseconnect, he's now at Microsoft Research, has been looking, uh, looking at deep reinforcement learning. Um, in particular, uh, in continuous action spaces. So we looked at, you know, uh, we, we, had a, um, we had a task that had um, action spaces that were discrete, but each had continuous parameters and built up a new um, neural network architecture for the function approximator within a deep reinforcement learning um, setting. And so especially those of you who are interested in deep RL, I encourage you to look at the, um, at the recent work of, of Matthew HouseConnect. And then the other, the other sort of main theme in my lab is, is multi-agent systems. And I had some great conversations with people today, especially about our work on uh, ad hoc teamwork. I already showed you some of the autonomous traffic management work we've been looking at. But just one slide to introduce ad hoc teamwork. Um, the challenge problem there is to try to create a player or an individual teammate, could be a player or a teammate in any kind of task, that has to coordinate with unknown previously unknown teammates without any control over them. So typically in a multi-agent system, you control the whole team, you figure out how they're going to communicate, how they're going to interact, you can give them roles. Um, in ad hoc teamwork, you just get to control one, one player, and it has to figure out how to behave with its current teammates. And so that, you know, people are good at this. I can go and play a pickup soccer game with people I've never seen before, and we figure out just by watching each other, where, what positions should we play, or what are they good at, who should I pass to, those kinds of things. Um, we'd like that to happen with robots too. If there's a disaster rescue scenario, if all of us bring robots from different parts of the world, we want them to be able to figure out how to coordinate on the fly. And so the challenge here is creating a good team player. If you're interested in this problem, we have a AAAI challenge paper from uh, 2010. There, we've looked at some theoretical approaches to this, but we've also looked at some more empirical work where um, the work of my student Sam Barrett looked at this predator-prey domain where we had uh, many students create teams of these uh, predator, red predator agents that had to surround the green prey, then we replaced uh, one with the one in the star, and it had that one with the star had to jump onto many, many different teams and find out what new behavior should it use for any of the, the previous teams. Similarly, we've done that in a robot, robot soccer setting. And my student, Katie Genter, who's probably the next to graduate from my lab, has been looking at this flocking scenario for ad hoc teamwork. So imagine a bunch of birds who are flying towards an imaginary airport here where my arrow is. We get to put in a few, the pink ones are the ones we control, how do we control them so that if each of the flock is, is changing its orientation based on its local neighborhood, that we can get them to go around, steer around the airport or steer wherever we want them to steer? We've been asking the questions of where should we place the ones that we can control and how should they change their headings to try to influence the flock? And so this is um, the setting drop-in competitions. And so those of you interested in that, we now have a series of workshops. There was a special issue of, uh, of JMOS on this, on this topic. Okay, so I've said a lot. Time is, is up. I just have to, of course, this isn't my own, just my own work. Um, the main components of this talk uh, were done by Patrick McAlpine, the layered, le overlapping layered learning, and Josiah Hanna, the grounded simulation learning. But there's many other students and postdocs. These are the ones I could fit on the slide. There's others who've contributed to this work over the years. Um, so many members from the Learning Agent Research Group over the past and present, and, and various uh, sponsors. But the question that we've, that, you know, I've, I've talk to you uh, about today is robot skill learning going from the real world to the simulator and back. 
Um, and uh, with that, I'll be happy for anybody who wants to stick around, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. The grounding function, you're relying on real world data to learn the grounding function. That's right. Aren't you, don't you have the similar challenges of just robot learning from real data like data efficiency? Or yeah, but this is, we, we're not learning the policy on the real robot. All we need to do is get enough data to learn the function of when I'm in a state and I take an action, what joint configuration do we get? And so it's, you don't need, a, that, that's something we can do with a, with a relatively small amount of data. So we were able to show that you know, with just uh, 15 trajectories of the robot walking, there's a lot of time steps within those 15 trajectories, but that's a, that's a feasible amount because it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it, it's a function with not as many free parameters as the whole thing you're trying to learn, right? So it's, it's a, a basically a, a way to snap the simulator in so that then we can do all of the data that's needed for searching in the policy space, which takes much more trials that we can do in the simulator. So yes, we have to do, you have to do some, you have to get some data from the real world or there's no hope of it being um, realistic, but we want to do just what's needed and then leverage as much as possible into the simulator. Much less data, or does the magnitude less data? Than yes. Please. So in, in the crowded simulation work, it seems that core to the idea is the transition model or your dynamics and what they try to incorporate into them. Um, do you ever find that trying to make your simulation model things that it's not meant to model leads to errors? For example, you might not be modeling contacts in the, in, that occur in the real world. Do you think that this can scale up to issues like that? Well, yeah. So, so. If we move, we say move to 90 degrees, it'll move partly, you know, there in one time step. And so the, the question is, how much of the way there? So if it moves 30 degrees in one time step, then every time we then s would, would have sent a command to the robot in simulation to move 90 degrees, we replace it with the command move 30 degrees, right? And so that's so that's an example of of, um, of something we know is not modeled correctly. Now. We could go and say, oh, let's take all the things that are modeled incorrectly and fix them. But that's what people have tried for years. And, and you know, so far, we've never been able to get a simulator that's, that's um, faithful enough. Right? And so I think that's, that's exactly what we're doing, is we're taking the things that the simulator is inevitably getting wrong and c correcting for them in a local way. Right? So we're not, we're not setting our task of making the, the simulator perfect throughout the whole search space, but just in the part that we're searching in right now. Yeah, Stefanos. Uh, I suspect the key component of a grounded simulation is learning the inverse function. Uh, is it easier to learn it because the action set is uh, relatively small? Um, yeah, I mean, so I didn't get into the detail here, but we're, what we're doing is we are learning for each joint independently. So there's. We have, you know, I think there's, uh, there's 32 different joints on the robot. We're learning each of them. The action space is, um, is a con it's a continuous action, but it's, it's one-dimensional. Um, of course, you know, in, in practice, there are dependencies between these. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the more complex it gets, the more data we'll probably need to do, uh, to learn the inverse function. Now, learning the inverse function is, uh, inverse model is easier because that's in simulation, right? The forward model is, is you need real data for. The inverse model is something we can do from simulated trajectories, right? Because the question is, if I'm in this state and I take this action, and I want to get to this joint configuration, what action do I need to take? You can get data for that by just executing trajectories in simulation, state action to joint configuration. So in some sense, I'm not as worried about the inverse one in terms of how much data it takes as I am in the forward model. But it's a good, it's a good point and good question. Yeah? I'm curious how much, you're, you or how much you do and how much you anticipate being able to reuse things you've learned uh, across different types of actions where it might uh, be used as some sort of fudge factor, something of like maybe like friction coefficients for a standing paper that's running. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's something we haven't explored. And that's something, I mean, we have, I should, yeah, I, so I said we, that one, 
I, I, you know, I said if you have a parameterization of the simulator, then you could try to learn that, you know, search in that parameterization space, which we didn't do. But we have looked at trying to do that. And, and exactly things like coefficients of friction are um, parameters in the simulation. And so it's not, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable at all to, to, to try to search in that space. And, um, uh, but so far, the method that's worked is the one that I talked about. That, that's, I think, a, a, a Good open thread for for research, and I'd be really interested if uh, if doing that leads to, to something interesting. So, yeah, if it's something you're interested in, keep me keep me posted. Any other questions? Okay, so I actually uh, forgot to tell that there is a, what is it called PSR? Yes, There's a reception uh, right after where everybody can ask more questions to Peter. But why don't we wrap up? Was there anybody like? No. Okay. Why don't we wrap up and then we can uh, talk with him at the reception? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.